Welcome to the AGO, uh, which is where I live and work, mostly live. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Mississauga, the New Credit, and on land that has been home to the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee uh, through time. Uh, I mentioned, you know, welcome to AGO. I work here at AGO. I'm the head of Canadian art. And um, before I start uh, the talk, which I've given a couple times, once in Calgary and once in Montreal, since we're in the AGO, I just wanted to acknowledge something important, which is that uh, something I'm very conscious of, and my team here is very conscious of, is that many people who come to the AGO to see the Canadian collection, and that's like a huge percentage of our visitors, um, they're not necessarily coming to learn about Canadian art history anymore. They're actually coming to look at the collection to think about Canada, which is a real shift. So our programs here around the collection really focus on Canadian studies, social history, Indigenous studies and Indigenous history, and we're a lead partner with the Toronto District School Board on their Indigenous Studies program. So I wanted to say that because what I'm going to talk about, and which I have talked about in various other um, uh, panels, um, has been this sort of idea of branding, that Canada has historically branded itself using images of nature and has argued um, or presented these images uh, with the idea that they reflect a sort of a pristine, untouched, or to use a, a period phrase, a little problematic, virgin wilderness. And so what I'm going to show you tonight uh, will challenge those ideas and basically uh, also is, is connected to the notion that nature has always been changing, that uh, the human species has always been changing and shaping nature. And often what we think is a natural uh, system is, is often uh, uh, been largely altered by human presence. So I start with this image of uh, a stamp, a 10 cent stamp. Some of you may remember 10 cent stamps. I vaguely remember 10 cent stamps. Uh, this one has an image of Tom Thompson's The Jack Pine, uh, one of his greatest paintings, uh, belongs to the National Gallery of Canada. Um, but I want to begin uh, with this quote. Um, so the image you're seeing is like, uh, an image of a, of a lone tree on an island, but a different tree on a different kind of island, but a suburban island, something that maybe uh, I think many of us are familiar with. But I've paired the image with um, a quote, quite famous quote from an American uh, urban planner named Jake Page, and it's Jake Page's Law of Severed Continuity. And it goes, you name a place for what is no longer there as a result of your actions. So one has Foxcrest Farms, for example, where no fox will ever again hunt and no plow will make a furrow worth the name. And so part of my argument that I put forward is that historically Canada has branded itself or described itself much like Jake Page's laws, that we've, we've um, labeled or branded ourselves to be something that we, we are the opposite of. And that for much of its history, Canada has been uh, a place of resource extraction, extensive resource extraction. And these landscapes that uh, and, and the famous artists of the Group of Seven, um, the works that they produce either explicitly reveal industry and resource as part of our founding as a Western colonized nation. So in this painting you see here by J.H. McDonald, one of the founding members of the Group of Seven, you see timber piles, you see the tracks, and you see the gas works in the distant. This is actually East Toronto. In this fabulous painting by Franklin Carmichael from the McMichael, um, you see a northern silver mine. Many of Carmichael's paintings are, in fact, of mining uh, in the north. And how did the group of seven get to these places and their peers? Well, they got there on trains, uh, and much of the, the infrastructure that took these artists into the north of Ontario and northern Canada was actually infrastructure from industry. So this painting here, which is one of my favorite Tom Thompson's, it's in the collection of the Art Gallery of Hamilton, city where I grew up, um, is called the Birch Grove Autumn. And many people look at this and, and really love it, and it's promoted to tourists that this is Canada, the north, the fall, the beautiful fall colors. This is nature at its most pure and natural. It's actually what you're seeing is, uh, is what is really a post-industrial landscape. Algonquin Park looks like it does. We have brilliant fall colors in the fall because um, the old growth forest of white pine was largely clear cut in the 19th century. So it looks like this because of industry. So I'm going to walk you through a whole series of images uh, of Tom Thompson, and then I'm going to talk about Emily Carr. And I've chosen these two artists to sort of, to sort of uh, explore these ideas of what's in the paintings, what's explicit, 
but also what is hinted at or suggested within the work. So here's Tom Thompson uh, with his pipe and his fish. Thompson loved to fish. One of the main reasons he liked to spend a lot of time in Algonquin Park wasn't so much to paint, but it was like he liked to fish and he liked to be away from the city. But it, the important thing that you see in this photograph is in the background or the distance. So what you're seeing is the chipyards from the uh, sawmills that used to be around Canoe Lake, where Tom Thompson was based, based out of Moat Lodge in the park. This is what Canoe Lake Station looked like. And again, in the background, you can see, uh, you can see in the distance very short, scrubby trees that have just started to grow back. And you can see sort of clear cut around. Thompson is arriving in Algonquin Park on the train, uh, train lines that were first built for industry and then followed by, um, by tourism. Algonquin Park was established, we think of it as a park, uh, but it was established, as Andrew and I were talking earlier, as a forest reserve. So it is, it is a park where people could go camp, there were lodges, uh, there were summer camps, but it was also an actively logged space, still is actively logged. Um, so in Tom Thompson's day, the logging was quite extensive. So this image, on the left you see, uh, it's a map showing logging limits, the licenses to log in the park. And on the right, you see one of the, one of the uh, regular substantial log jams that used to form. This is one along the Opiongo River. Uh, if you can see closely in the map, you'll also see the names of who owned the licenses. And a number of, you'll see the Booth family, who Booth logged extensively, and also the Molson family, or the Molson company, that also owned a lot of the land or rights to log in the land. So this is what Algonquin Park looked like at the end of the 19th century. This is... Uh, after the initial wave of clear cutting of all the white pine out of the park. Um, and so the birches and the maples all come in after to replace uh, what was here. So that, you know, talking about that through these documentary images is one thing, but it also shows up extensively in Tom Thompson's paintings. So you do get paintings like the Birch Grove Autumn, where the painting, what you see in the work, the landscape is actually the trace of an industrial process. But also in Tom Thompson's work, about half of the paintings explicitly depict logging practice. So on the left here, you see Tom Thompson's sketch, which is downstairs in the Thompson, uh, or actually, sorry, that's the National Galleries, which is Tea Lake Dam. And on the right, you see the dam at Tea Lake. And then there's a man on the right fishing. There's Tom Thompson at Tea Lake Dam fishing. Uh, and the work on the left is the same dam. Thompson extensively painted this infrastructure of logging, partly because he was interested in the, in the structures, uh, but also he liked to fish at the dams. These were really great places to fish. The, pa the photo on the right is actually by Lauren Harris from 1914. This is one of his uh, best known canvases. It's called The Drive, owned by the University of Guelph. The pointers uh, from the University of Toronto. In the foreground, you see the pointer boats. Uh, and then also, there's a, a raft being pulled along with horses on it. Um, these are what pointer boats look like. So again, within Tom Thompson's work, the, the history of logging and industry in Algonquin Park isn't hidden. It actually informs the work. It actually shapes the, lands, the very landscape he's painting. This is actually one of my favorite works by Tom Thompson. It's called Fire Swept Hills, and it's downstairs in the Thompson collection, and uh, really reveals what a great painter Thompson was. This is an incredible mix of like, uh, color. It's painted on the spot. Thompson was great at working with an awful lot of different color very quickly without turning it into a kind of muddy mess, which uh, is, is actually easy to do. This is a really hard painting to, to produce. But again, fire swept hills. Thompson worked as a fire ranger in the park. That's what he did in 1916. So the other artist I, I quickly want to touch on is Emily Carr. So Emily Carr was based in Vancouver, born in Victoria, painted throughout Vancouver Island, particularly in the latter part of her life and the lower part of Vancouver Island. And she extensively painted second and third growth and clear-cut landscape. So what you're seeing in this painting here from Vancouver Art Gallery called um, Vanquished, in the foreground, uh, you're seeing both the remains of, of indigenous uh, the poles from, from a village, but you're also seeing like clear-cut stumps and poles, uh, posts. The time that Emily Carr is painting, the logging industry in BC is sort of aware of developing a practice which is more based on sustaining and managing the forest, that you just can't keep cutting things down. And so at the time that Carr is painting in this very landscape you see in this photograph, the government is actually doing an inventory of the forests. 
So you can find these great photographs that match the landscape. So this is a Douglas fir cutting area in the southern part of, of um, Vancouver Island. Uh, so in many of her landscapes, you will see in the foreground the stumps of old growth, uh, the old growth forests that were taken out. You'll also see uh, these, again, in the painting on the left, Scorned as Timber, Beloved of the Sky, you see the stumps, but also this lone tree that's left standing. On the right is a photograph, um, and it's called Topping the Spar Tree. The, uh, when they were logging the forests in BC, they used to bring in the rail lines and the rail cars, and they would leave a single old growth tall tree, top it, and then they would attach all the pulleys to it, and they would use that tree as the spar to then lift all the logs and put them onto the rail cars to take them out. The painting on the left by Carr is a painting of one of the spar trees before it's been topped. And then the last image I'm going to show you um, on the left is Carr's painting above the gravel pit. Uh, and on the right is a photograph of that gravel pit about 10 years ago that I took. So on the outskirts of, of um, Victoria, there was a big gravel pit, and that's where they obviously got all the aggregate to build buildings and the roads that sustained the, the expansion of that city. Um, at the time that I took this for photograph, the city edges were just kind of arriving. Uh, the the uh, gravel pit was about to be erased by a new suburb. And so that, again, is what's appearing in these works of art. So um, I've gone on a little longer here, but it's my house, so I, I can do that. Uh, but I want to sort of just distress to everybody that to, when you're looking at Canadian art, when you walk through these collections, and when you see things, look closer. Uh, don't just accept them as these sort of iconic images of Canada's nature, but see them as real traces of the history of this place, a deeply peopled and a deeply human space. So thank you so much.